Only she can prevent the darkness from engulfing the world. The world's fascination with monsters harks back to the dawn of civilization and even to prehistoric times when mankind first sought to explain the magical and capricious forces of nature. Civilized as they were, the ancients, that is, the stories they told were filled with horrifying creatures. They called them monsters, and there was nothing civil about them. From Antaeus, the bloodthirsty cannibal giant, to Hecate, the beautiful, ambitious tormentor of the dead, to the ogre Fafner, whose guests for dinner become his dinner, the monsters of mythology embody the dark side of human nature. Their battles with Ulysses and Jason and the other heroes and heroines of legend represent the ongoing contest between all that is worst, all that is best, and all that stands in between. Tonight, we feature the Nemean Lion, a murderous beast who terrorizes the people of Nemea with his ivory dagger teeth, brass talons, and impenetrable armor hide. The Nemea is merely a practice ground for this lion. His true task is to serve Zeus, king of the gods, who needs a special monster to destroy the latest threat to his rule. The latest threat to Zeus's king of the gods' rule is... <clears throat> A sickly, undersized little girl, destined, the, co the god king has warned, to shake his entire kingdom. Unaware of heroic, her heroic fate, the tiny Palamona falls in love with Melampus, the healer, who can revive the dead and save them from an eternity in Tartarus under Hades' brutal reign. But the healer's betrayal and Palamona's yearning for his love soon lead her to the grotesque bull man who employs bulls to savagely tear his victims in half, shredding their skin and bones, spilling their blood like fertilizer across his furrowed lands. The bull man quickly prepares Palamona for a similar end, one that would leave this ancient time desperately short of heroes. Caught between a world she so much wants to love and a world she is terribly unsure of, this young girl struggles to find the answers. They lie just beyond her reach. Surrounded by treacherous gods, enormous killer bees, and leather-winged demons. She must face one of the most terrifying and frightening creatures ever to walk the land, the Nemean Lion. Standing alone, this brave little girl is the only one who can prevent the darkness from engulfing an already fragile world. Did you catch all that? Well, that's okay, because we're going to do the long version of the story right now. Bah, bah, bah. <clears throat> so hopefully you can hear us all good somewhere, somehow some way or see us on youtube or on live stream or whatever it might be and thank you mr quiet rick's got everything fixed up for us thank you sir deep breath and here we go oh it's going to give you a program with everybody's all the players names i forgot i'll send that to you next week atropos remember atropos from last week atropos lady of the shears could read that scroll which held the mighty secret of what was to be. This traffic with the future led Atropos special authority, so that she was feared by the gods themselves. Even their king, Zeus, who feared nothing, was made uneasy by Atropos. Sorry, brief pause. There, back again. <clears throat> We're getting there. Aha. Uh -huh. The next morning, when Zeus saw Scissor Hag winding her way among the flower beds in the Garden of Olympus, he knew by the smile on her face that she was bringing bad news for someone and hoped it was for someone else. Greetings, Your Majesty, she greeted. Uh, fair day to you, my lady. I trust the windstorm last night did not disturb your slumbers. I did not sleep much, my lord. Most old folk die at night, you know, <clears throat> and I must be ready with my shears snip, snip, when the thread of life has to be slipped. Yes, of, <clears throat> of course, muttered Zeus. Besides, she said, if I were inclined to nap, it would certainly not be when the thousand-year wind comes to jostle the stars. It's part of my task, you realize. To find the fiery splinters. Indeed, this time their message is especially interesting. Zeus shuddered as he heard these words and saw the smirk twisting her withered lips. 
for she smiled, he knew, only when she had something unpleasant to announce. He said nothing, just waited. <laughs> this concerns you, O oh mighty Zeus. Uh, I am all attention. A certain child dwells in the deep wood. A sickly, undersized babe, but she is fated to shake your kingdom. Pah! Impossible, growled Zeus. Nay, nay, my lord. Possible. <laughs> Even, perhaps, probable. And how can such a thing be? Well, this girl child is destined to be the embodiment of female strength and wisdom, and will dedicate herself to avenging the great goddess. Yea, she will seek to restore the glory of the mother, even by dislodging you from your throne. Ridiculous! Even if she had wings, it's still ridiculous. Yes, well, I don't know about wings, but quarrel with the thousand-year wind and the splintered stars, my lord, not with me, who only reads their message to you. Well, whose child is she? Who has spawned her? <laughs> Mystery, mystery within mystery within mystery. Yes, but she will claim to be Hera's daughter, although not yours. Indeed, she will call herself Heraclea. Well, uh, <clears throat> I thank you for your warning, my lady. Where do I find this presumptuous little brat? In the depths of the forest girdling Thebes. She is called Palemona now. The name Heraclea will come later. Uh, too late, said Zeus. I shall hunt her down and snuff her out before she can pronounce that absurd name. <laughs> Good hunting, said Atropos, grinning, and humped off. After she left, Zeus thought very hard. Mm. Well, how shall I proceed with this, he asked himself. Hasten to Thebes and gaff her with a thunderbolt? Effective but unwise. It would proclaim to the world that she is as important as she claims to be. Dangerous enough to attract my personal attention and merit the use of my ultimate weapon. <laughs> no. No, no. I shall do her no such honor. She must die. But her death must resemble other deaths. In other words, <laughs> I shall employ a monster. Yes, but which monster? Yes, yes. And he thought, and he thought, and he puzzled and puzzled. And then he puzzled some more until, well, you know the rest, until his puzzler was sore. There are monsters aplenty, he told himself, but they all seem to work for other gods. Hades employs Cerberus. Poseidon commands a hideous flotilla of sea serpents. The snake-haired Medusa <laughs> serves Athena's vengeance, doesn't she? And the Caledonian boar is the handiwork of my daughter Artemis. The Cyclops work for the smith god inside Smoky Aetna. A dreadful three-headed Garion acts for my wife, Hera. Mm. The Chimera tends to be freelance and stupid besides. I, I could borrow one of these repulsive creatures, no doubt, but to do so would be to reveal my intention toward the, that little forest brat. No, no. What I must do is find one that will be mine alone. A good one, expert. My grandmother, Gaia, most ancient of earth goddesses, has spawned an enormous brood of monsters, as well as giants, titans, and gods. She'll help me if I ask her. Yes, well, what shall I ask her for? I am hampered by my keen sense of beauty. I detest ugliness. And the appearance of these monsters tends to be revolting. Surely, though, there must be some creature who possesses a, a bestial of beauty. Hmm, a lion, for example. All other animals tremble when his scent is borne to them on the wind. When he roars, their marrow freezes, they're too frightened to run, and he kills them with one stroke of his barbed paw and devours them at leisure. Yes, yes, a lion. He's a killer and magnificent, a very king of beasts as I am the king of the gods. A lion. Ah, the idea grows on me. But an animal such as one, such as no one has ever seen, or has even dreamed. One that will make an ordinary lion look like a house cat. Heh. <makes noise> Superb notion. I must summon Gaia now. And so he sent a message to Gaia and received her in the Garden of Olympus, bowing low to her. 
O queen of the earth, wise and powerful, I ask your help. <clears throat> to be asked when it is yours to command. To be given no op an opportunity to assist omnipotence. This, my kingly grandson, is to do me a high honor. How can I serve you, O Zeus? I am displeased with certain mortals. A nation full of mortals, in fact, the Nemeans. Well, how have they offended you? They favor <clears throat> other gods. Hmm. They shun my temples. They pray to me seldom, and they make me few gifts. Oh, well, of course they deserve to be pun punished. Of course, of course. Yes, yes, of course. Well, I do not wish to visit them with swift destruction, blast them with my lightning, incinerate their forests and their cities, for they would be die ignorant and serve no example to others. Their punishment must be spaced over time. I want to teach them a slow <laughs> lesson in the meaning of true faith. I need a monster. Oh, no problem there, grandson. Not a fire-spitting dragon, mind. Not a gaping serpent, nor something with a lot of heads. That's not my style, grandmother. I crave an imperial beast, yes? A lion, but a very special one. No oh, special. How how special do you want this lion to be? What? Do you... I want him huge. Earth. Huge. Surpassing ordinary lions as we gods surpass the mortals. And let his teeth be um, like ivory daggers, his talons, uh, his talons, made of brass and as big as bailing hooks, yes. His hide should be a supple armor that no spear point or arrowhead can pierce, and no blade can slash. <laughs> it's a task worthy of my best efforts, murmured Gaia. Take your time, take your time, says this. I want him perfect. When next I see you, grandson, I shall be accompanied by your special lion. And Gaia left Zeus, and he laughed gustily, shaking the trees. <laughs> She'll take her time, all right. <laughs> She's slow, Mother Earth. Slow but sure. However, there's no hurry. A century is a summer's afternoon to me. I can afford to be patient. I'll let the lion roam to Mia for a while. Feast upon the inhabitants thereof and their cattle and teach them the cost of impiety. He'll grow into his work and gain a reputation when I do send her acme against him. <laughs> her death will seem entirely natural, won't it? Huge fish treats would smell like huge fish treats. Yes. <clears throat> Chapter 2. The Waif Now no woodsman ever entered the grove where the dryads dwelt, for it was a sacred copse. And a woodcutter was circling the grove one day when he saw a pile of dead leaves tremble and heard a faint mewing cry. He dug into the leaves and he felt something squirm. He pulled it out. No, it was not a kitten. It was an infant, a girl. He yelled with joy. For his wife had just had a miscarriage with their first child, and he thought that the gods had answered their grief with a gift of another child. He bore the little baby home, and the young couple raised her as their own, naming her Palamona. Other children came. They soon outgrew her. She was a curious child altogether, so weirdly small, that tall family. Huge yellow eyes flared in her famished face. Eyes of a panther and a mouse's face, the father said. But she was tough as a bowstring. She was never ill and would play tirelessly from dawn till night. And so little Palamona lived quite happily until her twelfth year. Then one night a robber band came to the hut. They killed the woodsman and they abducted his wife. They rounded up the children to sell the slave mart in Thebes. Little Palamona fled. A robber chased her. He was a tall, gawky fellow, but she was a very fast runner despite her size and was drawing away from her pursuer. But then another robber jumped out from behind a tree and stood in her path. She tried to duck around him, but he grabbed her. She went lip, limp. His grip slackened. Her hand flashed up and she struck like a cat, raking his face with her nails, gouging with all her strength, feeling the flesh pull away. He screamed and lunged for her. His face dripped blood. He did not stop to wipe it, but kept after her. She dodged under his arm and darted toward the river. Then little Palamona flung herself off the bank, flattening her body in a shallow dive. Had she wished to escape, she could have swum underwater, for she slid through the water like an eel. Yes, but Palamona did not want to escape. She wanted 
him to follow her into the river. She surfaced immediately. She saw him standing knee-deep, looking for her. She dived again and came up in a thick clump of weeds. She splashed to attract his attention. Oh, Mr. Robber. And then pretended to struggle in the water as if she'd been caught in the reeds. Help, help, oh my. His head swiveled. He saw her. She saw his teeth flash in the bloody mask of his face and knew that he was grinning. He was a squat man, very hairy. <clears throat> as he came near her, she moved very slowly out through the clinging reeds, and he waded towards her. Now he was waist deep. She waited until he was almost within arm's length, then dived. She groped in the mud until she found a heavy little rock. She arched in a tight turn underwater. She slid behind him and swept his legs out from under him. She surfaced as he sank and waited for him to come up. I like this girl. As he rose, spluttering... <clears throat> Wee little Palamona lifted her arm high and slammed the rock down on his head. He grunted and collapsed. She stood shoulder deep, watching the bubbles rise. She saw the water changing color and couldn't bear the idea of his blood fouling her river. She went under, seized him by the hair, and dragged him up. His eyes were closed. His face was greenish white. He did not seem to be breathing. Oh, dear. She shifted her grip and held him beneath the armpits. Blood seeped through his soaked hair. She dragged him to the shore and let him drop. She took off her tunic and watched it in the river, beating it against a flat rock. Then she dived again and swam underwater, keeping away from the clump of reeds, turning and corkscrewing until she felt clean. Then little Palamona came out, put on her wet tunic, and went to look at the robber. Yes, the robber lay there, motionless. His hair was a mat of blood. Fat blue flies buzzed slowly about his head. She felt her stomach churning and fought back nausea, trying to cling to triumph. Flies clawed about his head. She waved them away, blaming him. Even dead, he kept attacking her, smearing her with filth. Uh, but was he dead? Was that not a thread of pulse in his fat throat? He was one of those who had killed her foster father, remember? And she needed him dead. 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 But she did not want to touch him. Ew. She stood up and looked at the river. Its waters had turned red in the setting sun. It was fouled then forever. She would never swim in it again. She would never do anything again that she had done before. She turned and raced toward the meadow, across the meadow, away from the river, into the forest. She did not head for the hut that had been her home, no. She turned. She turned left and struck deeper into the woods. Night came, and she still moved through the trees. Wind rattled the leaves. Palomona was chilled now in her damp tunic. She welcomed the chill and drew it into her great gasping breaths. She sat at the foot of a tree, trying to let the wind blow into her mouth, sucking its coldness, feeling it shrink the hot lump of blood and flies. Chapter 3. Vengeance of the Hive Palamona lay under the tree and tried to sleep. She became aware of how many sounds the wood held, rustling, scuttlings, a howl, a hoot, a tiny shriek. She was not afraid, though. She meant to stay in the forest forever and never see anybody again. Even if she knew something was going to eat her, she would not go back to the clearing where the hut had stood and where she had seen her father fall in mid-stride with an arrow through her throat. Moonlight sifted through the trees. There was a silver pepper of stars. The moonlight grew stronger, became silvery green, almost hot. Something blotted the light. Hanging above her was a blunt head. She sprang to her feet. It was a snake's head on a tall, thick stalk of neck rising from the coils of its own body. She saw the head coming down. It was choked by the beating of her heart. She felt her legs being touched. She tried to run. Her legs would not move. She was paralyzed. A soon swoon came over her. She felt the body of the snake wrapping itself about her, strand upon living strand, looping around her. Her arms were bound to her side. She was encased in serpent. She had seen one crush a deer once, and she knew that this, this was how they did it, looping about the victim, tightening the coils, making it soft enough to swallow. She did not scream. Nothing would make her scream. The snake's body was strange upon her, smooth, hard, and cool. She was growing warm in its leather hug. But she was not being crushed. No, not yet. Did a snake play with its victim like a cat? She could breathe without constriction, but could not move. And now the wedge-shaped head was so close she could see its small eyes glittering in the moonlight, and softly it began to sing. 
another mother bore you. Has she something for you? Hush, hiss, I leave a kiss within your ear. Listen, listen, you shall hear what few have ever heard. Listen, listen to beast and bird. She felt the hard leather of its head on her cheek, and a tickling in one ear, then another. A piercing sweetness entered through her ears, a colored flame dancing down her body, all pressure gone as the loops melted away. She whirled, calling, Don't go! She chased the snake. It entered shadow. She sped after it, calling, Come back, come back, oh, please come back. But it was gone. She danced in the sifting moonlight. She heard an angry buzzing. It turned into words. Beware, comes thief, comes bear. Where, where, where? O white knight, sisters, Lorikas will seek us. Guard the hive, guard it well. Take wing, take wing, dive and sting. A white knight, prepare to fight. Rikas will seek us. Palomino looked for the voices. The moon rode in full blaze now, soaring, turning the trees to bone. One white tree had a black hole in its trunk, and three bees crisscrossed, diving into shadow in and out. I know what they're saying, she thought. I can understand the language of bees. How wonderful, but who is this Lorikas who robs their hive? She saw a dark shape lumbering across the glade. She saw it rise terribly on two legs, stand tall and thick, then drop again to all fours and pad toward the tree with its rolling gait, and she knew it was a bear. I don't think it's related to Atalanta, no. Well, maybe, I don't know. First time, I'm hearing the story for the first time myself, too, so maybe this bear is related to Atalanta, I don't know. And then she saw another shape running. It wore a dark tunic. She saw the blurred whiteness of legs and arms and face. It sliced past the bear, which rose again and roared, teeth glinting. The runner did not pause, but flung himself upon the hollow tree and began to climb with amazing speed. The black hole in the trunk broke into bits and became a swarm of bees buzzing spuriously, clotting about the climber's head and shoulders. They'll sting him to pieces, she thought. One arm flailed, brushing away the bees. The other came out of the hole. A hand stuffed something into a pouch. He reached high, clutched a branch, and swung, swung. And Palamona gazing in wonder, saw a face catch the moonlight, the face of youth, wrapped with excitement. The bear stood under the tree, clawing the trunk, roaring. The young man swung out of the branch, let go, and flew in a long, arching leap past the bear, hit the ground running, and disappeared among the trees. Panamona darted after him. He was a very fast runner, it turned out. And far behind her, she heard the bear roaring. She ran and ran, following the faint sounds of... Far ahead, she broke out of the trees into another clearing where stood a little hut with lighted windows. She saw the boy go into that hut. She crept up to the window and looked in. An old woman sat on a stool, taking honeycomb from the boy's hand. She crammed it into her mouth and chomped furiously, honey dripping over her chin. She wiped her hands on her long gray hair and cackled. <laughs> thank you, Rikas. Thank you, thank you, my dear, dear Rikas. Oh, did they sting you, my boy? They broke their stingers on me, mother. <laughs> of course they did, of course they did. Are you hungry, son? We're both hungry, mother. Yeah. Milk in the jug, loaf on the hob, and honey, 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 a plenty. <laughs> so, so sweet. <laughs> Palamona wanted to keep watching them, but suddenly found herself starving. She had not eaten since the middle of the day before. She left the hut and went back into the wood herself. She saw a squirrel and heard herself say, Fetch me some nuts, little brother. In a cheering little voice that she did not recognize as her own, Little brother, I'm lost and hungry. Bring me some nuts, please. Uh, all gone. None left. Slim pickings, slim pickings, said the squirrel. There's a berry bush in that thicket yonder. You can eat your fill. Well, thank you, said Palamona, who went off thinking. You're lying, you furry little rat. You have nuts aplenty in your hoard. But she found a bush loaded with berries and gorged herself, ate until she could eat no more. Now she was drowning in sleepiness, and she stumbled toward the hut. Its windows were dark. She chose a tree at the edge of the clearing, lay down behind it, and fell into a deep, deep sleep. Speaking of cats. Hello, Orlando. 
and Zephod. Hello, Zephod. Palavona arose early the next morning and waited until Rikus came out. He went among the trees, and she followed him. She followed him all day long as he rambled the wood. He did not meet anyone. He fished and picked berries and poked into every hollow tree looking for more beehives. She went where he went, stopped when he stopped, keeping herself hidden. He went home for lunch, bearing a fish wrapped in wet leaves and berries and a pouch full of honeycombs. Again, Palamona stationed herself at the window hole and saw the old woman stuffing herself. She left when she saw the lad stretch out on a pallet of rushes and go to sleep. Then she wandered into the woods alone. She found a stream and pulled reeds and plated them into a little basket. She marked the location of various berry bushes. Acorns, acorns were easy to find, but too hard to crack open with her teeth. She pounded them with a rock and ate their bitter kernels, for she did not wish to eat meat or fish or anything that had once been alive. Although she had banished it from her waking hours, a meaty face still hung upon her sleep, dripping blood. Everywhere she went, she spoke to animals, to birds, to squirrels, to rabbits, to larger animals also. She hailed a deer as it fled past. Curiosity broke its flowing stride. It turned in midair, bounded back to her, and, and said, Did I hear right? Did you mean did I call to you? I did. I want so much to make your acquaintance. But where did you learn our language, little sister? A, a serpent licked my ear. Oh, yes, that would do it. She loved the bugling speech of deer. It was a young stag, glossy-coated, horn-proud. Um, may, may I ride you? Oh, yes, yes. Jump on, jump on. She laughed with joy and leaped upon his back. She slid up to his neck and grasped his antlers, holding tight, shouting. He went into a long, flowing stride. She moved on to his head and perched between his horns as he swam a river. She could have ridden him forever, but was afraid of wearying him with the violence of her joy. <clears throat> she slid off on the farther bank of the river and said, Thank you, brother. That was a wonderful ride. Oh, you are welcome, little one. You are so light, I didn't even feel you sitting up there. Will, will I see you again? She asked shyly. Oh, you will, you will, he bugled and leaped away. Joy gave Palamona courage then. She did what she had been afraid to do. She filled her basket with berries and followed the bear's tracks until she saw him sidling along. She heard her voice turn to a rumbling growl. Greetings, O lord of the forest. I bring you a gift of berries. The bear swerved his head and looked at her, rose to his full height, and squatted on his haunches, staring at her. Mwah, me. Who are you? What are you? I, are you a person? I'm a little girl. Where'd you learn that bear talk, O oh, daughter of man? A serpent licked my ear. Ah, oh, yeah, yes, yes, I see, I see. That would do it, wouldn't it? Mm. Well, bring me berries, bring me berries, then. She approached, moving slowly, and handed him the basket. He took it in one huge paw, and she thought he was going to swallow it whole, but he tipped the little basket, and the berries rolled into his maw. Thank you, girl. Can we be friends, my lord? May I come and speak with you sometimes? Yes, you may, you may. I like all kinds of berries, also grubs and fish and honeycomb. And so, I mean, if you're coming to uh, speak to me anyway, and let's see, I also like, well, um, <clears throat> she interrupted. I can't promise you grubs or fish. I don't like to kill things. But why not? They crawl back into my sleep and my dreams. <laughs> They don't crawl into my sleep. I sleep all winter long and nothing wakes me, but bring what you will. You're very polite for a... What are you? A little girl. Yes, well, farewell, girl. The sun was low now. Palamona raced back to the hut to be ready when Rikas came out. She didn't know why she had, follow, had to follow him. It was weary business. Sometimes it made her lonelier than ever just seeing him, never speaking to him, but... Well... She could not make herself known, now could she? She dared not trust anyone who was not an animal. Nevertheless, it eased her heart to look at him. One day he tramped a longer distance than usual and led her to a part of the wood which she had not seen before. She heard a regular thudding and voice weeping. Rikus lengthened his stride. She ran swiftly to keep him in view. She saw a man swinging an axe, chopping at an oak tree, and out of the tree came a musical voice, weeping and pleading. Don't, please, don't chop it down. Please stop. This is my home. If you chop it down, I will die. 
Well, come out and let me take a look at you then, said the axe man. Will you stop chopping if I do? I can tell you this. If you don't come out, I won't stop chopping. A green-clad figure, tall and pliant, came glicing out of the tree. The man leaned on his axe, grinning at her. Palamona felt a spasm of hatred shake her. The way he was looking at the green-clad one made her, reminded her of the robber she had killed. Regis had stepped into the shadow of another tree and was watching them. Well, well, you are a pretty one, aren't you? <laughs> leered the man with the axe. I am a dryad, good sir. My life is attached to the tree in which I dwell. If it falls, I die. Nonsense! <laughs> I know how to keep you happy, but I've got to cut down this tree. Because I'm a woodsman, you see, and that's what I do. I cut down trees. He swung his axe again, chips flew, the dryad moaned. Drop that axe! called Rikus, stepping into view. The woodsman, a hulking brute, stared at the lad, who was slender as a sapling, did not look at all dangerous. Are you speaking to me? You talking to me? Yes, I'm talking to you, you greasy tree butcher. Why, you little meddler? I'll chop you into a thousand pieces and feed you to the crows. Axe whirling, he rushed across the clearing to Rikus, who vanished. Palamona saw that he had simply leaped up, caught a low branch, and swung out of reach. The axe man crouched, moving in a slow circle, seeking his enemy. Ah, where are you, you little woodlouse? I thought you wanted to fight. The lad flung himself off the limb, landing square on the man's shoulder, knocking the axe from his hand, burying him to the ground, and before he could rise, the youth leaped away, snatched up the axe, and <laughs> smote off the woodsman's head. The dryad laughed, a high, keening shriek of laugh, and kicked the head back toward its spouting neck. He makes an ugly corpse, she said, but he'll be picked clean by tomorrow. She glided toward Rikus, caught him by the hand, and smiled at him. Thank you. Thank you, good sir. Palamona saw how beautiful she was. She saw the dryad, who was taller than the boy, take his face between her long hands and slowly begin to kiss him. Little nibbling kisses, and then a long kiss upon the lips. Her body seemed to twine like a vine about the boy, and Palamona shuddered, confused by what she was feeling, unable to look away. Ah, my sweetling, my brave one, she heard the dryad say. I must leave you now, unfortunately. The day grows old, and I must join the train of Artemis tonight and go hunting with her. It is my night to run with the goddess of the silver bow, and I dare not be absent. Oh, but, young one, I long to be with you, my handsome little stranger, my brave one, my killer of brutes who has saved my dwelling and my life. Meet me tomorrow, won't you? And you shall have a hero's reward. Where shall I meet you? said Rikus. Palamono could hear the hunger in his voice. I'll send you a messenger who will tell you when and where. You will know by noon. But do not fail me. Send your messenger. I'll be there. The dryad kissed him again and glided back to her tree and vanished. The next morning, instead of going to the hut, Pelamona went to the oak tree, for she was eaten up by curiosity about this dryad. She had heard that she, one should never mess with dryads. She wanted to suspect this one, though, of treachery, and wanted to think she'd been lying to Rikus and would send no messenger. But if she did send a messenger, then Palamona very much wanted to know whom she would send. Where the woodsman had fallen was a heap of scoured bones. He'd been picked clean, as the dryad had promised, humming a, a wordless tune. The tree nymph wandered over to the bones and kicked them into a neat pile, then kicked leaves over them. Her humming became a buzzing as Palamona heard her call, Come, come, come. A fat bee flew to her, po poising at face level, wings whirring, so black it looked purple. I'm here, it buzzed. What is your bidding? I need a messenger to fly to my love, so I've called you, oh honeymaker, for who flies as swiftly as you? Fly then to Rikus, to the lad, Rikus, the sweet one, the brave one, and tell him to meet me at Cleft Rock, three hours past noon. Rikus, Cleft Rock. 
three hours past noon. Find him, tell him, fly, fly, fly. The bee circled her head twice and streaked off. As the shot passed Palamonis' head, the girl heard it buzzing to itself. Hive robber, beware. She shouldn't have sent a bee, thought Palamona. They hate Rikus. And she flashed away, not to the hut, but to where she knew Rikus would be at this hour, swimming at the bend of the river where it ran deep. He was there, splashing, caroling to himself, diving, scrubbing himself with sand. Hidden behind a tree, she kept listening for the hum of the bee, but heard nothing. Rikus had clad himself again and was sitting on the bank, throwing pebbles into the water, watching the circles widen. He did not wear his keen hunter's look. His lips were parted, his eyes dreaming. He rose and looked about, picked up a twig and snapped it, threw the pieces away. He patted together a wall of mud and then stamped it into the ground. Suddenly, he began running. She followed him. He ran through the wood to his hut and burst in. Mother, 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 has a messenger come? Messenger? Have you brought me any honey? I haven't eaten since breakfast. I crave something sweet, son. Did anyone come for me, mother? Did anyone come to tell me anything? Who comes here, my son? No one. Why should they? We don't want anyone. Go fetch me a honeycomb. He whirled and dashed out. Palabona was buffeted by a different feeling. She was glad he was not meeting the dryad, but was sad because he was sad, and as she watched him waiting for the message that did not come, she pitied him more and more. Shall I tell her myself, she thought. Appear before him and tell him where to meet her. He'll be so happy to hear from her, he won't even notice me. Yes, I'll tell him, I'll tell him. But she could not bring herself to do it. A magic circle had been drawn about the lovers, and she was forever outside. She must be forever invisible to him. She could not break that circle. She glanced at the sun. Well, <clears throat> almost three hours past noon, she said to herself. I can't tell him. But I'll go to Cleft Rock and tell her that the bad bee never delivered her message. Then she can find him herself. And they shall be happy together, and I'll go to another part of the forest. So she left Rikus then and ran as fast as she could to Cleft Rock. When she got there, she found the dryad standing still, her face pale and hard as she listened to the bee who was circling her head. I found Rikus. I found him as you bade me. I told him to meet you at th here at three hours past noon. But he brushed me away, crying, Let her wait then, the fool, for I will never come. I love none but my mother and never shall. You lie, you little buzzer, whispered the dryad. He loves me. He killed my enemy. He saved my life. He kissed me sweet as apples. You evil little wretch. Why do you lie? Why? Lady of the Oak, I do not lie. I tell only the truth. I swear it. If you do not believe he spurns your love, then wait here and see if he comes. The bee flew away. I'll tell her now, thought Palamon. I was about to go to the rock when the dryad suddenly shrieked. She stamped and moaned and moaned and tore her hair. Her face had turned green, almost the color of her dress. It did not lie, she cried. If he loved me, he would be here. Lovers hastened to their first tryst. No, no, he brushed off my messenger and laughed at my love. Well, the next bee that comes to him shall, he shall not ignore that bee. As Palamona watched in horror, the dryad raised her arms toward the sky, whirled faster and faster until she was a blur of green. The green darkened, her long form rose, pulling in on itself, rolling itself into a different shape, and there hung a bee. An enormous bee, greenish, black, big as a hawk. Glistening from its tail was a great naked sting the size of a spur, needle sharp. Death, 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 hum the enormous bee. And flew away so fast it seemed to vanish. Palamona started to race toward the hut, then stopped. No. He won't be there. He'll be searching for her, poor lad. He'll be at the oak tree waiting for her. She's going to the hut for him, and I'll go to the oak tree first and warn him. So Palamona raced toward the oak tree. Though she had run fast that far that day, now she ran faster than she had ever run before, but it was a long way, and the sun was sinking as she reached the oak. Sure enough, there was the lad waiting. Rikus, she called. Rikus. She saw his face grow radiant and thought, he thinks it's her calling. That's why he's smiling. Then she saw his smile disappear and saw him spring to his feet, heard a loud, vicious humming. The huge bee flew straight at him. He tried to cover his face with his hands, but the bee plunged its terrible, shining sting into the boy's chest. When his arms fell to cover his chest, the bee tilted, stabbing his neck again and again and again as the humming grew louder and louder and mingled with the boy's screams. 
Before she knew what she was doing, Palamona found herself there, beating at the bee with a stick. She saw the ghastly, many-faced glitter of the bee's magnified eyes and felt something stab her forearm. Icy coldness spread through her. Darkness swarmed, and she fell beside the boy. With her last strength, she pulled her arm to her mouth and tried to suck out the poison. She sucked and spat, sucked and spat, feeling herself go under. She saw a bloated, hairy blackness clinging to a branch above the boy's head. Dreamily, Palamona heard it sob with the dryad's voice. In the last glimmer of her sense, she saw it curl up and plunge the sting into its own body again and again and again. And the green body of the dryad fell on the other side of Rikas. Palamona fall, saw it fall as she sank into total darkness. Chapter 4, The Haunted Healer Only where the moon trembled in the river was the black skiff briefly visible. It was going too fast to be drifting in that slow current, yet it bore no sail, no oars dipped. Was someone in it? It passed too quickly to tell. And when that skiff rounded the bend past the drowned moon, it was engulfed in darkness. But someone did ride that skiff, one who did not wish to be seen. He sat in the stern, wrapped in a black cloak, face pulled into its hood, hands tucked under its skirt, so that no glimmer of him could be seen. The occasional hissing word he spoke could scarcely be distinguished from the wind among the reeds. It was a serpent talk he spoke, and a serpent he was speaking too. The great snake's tail was hooked into a ring bolted in the bow. bow. The entire thirty-foot length of it lay awash as it pulled the skip down the river. Frogs hopped frantically onto shore, fish died, birds grew still as a serpent rippled by. The only sound the man heard was a buzzing of two bees sipping the willow blossom. A tiny sound that had made the man hiss something to the snake who stopped swimming and moved its tail so that the skiff floated under the overhanging willow. The man listened intently to what the bees were saying, and then he hissed again. The serpent glided to shore, beaching the boat. The man climbed out and began to hurry through the trees, the serpent slithering alongside. But the man could not go fast. He limped. He spoke again to the snake immediately flowed up a tree, then swung down from a branch, and the man climbed in like a rope. He rode the serpent then as the strand of living muscle thrust itself from tree to tree in a smooth rush, going so swiftly that the man had to put his arms over his face to ward off the whipping branches. Then they came to a clearing in the forest, and there stood a huge oak, and under that huge oak tree lay three bodies. The man hissed. The snake wrapped itself about a limb and let itself hang to the ground, and the man slid down. Palamona felt herself being pulled up through the fathoms of darkness. It was as if someone had noosed her while she was swimming under water and was pulling her up before she was ready. She arched her body, trying to curve downward into a dive again, trying to plunge back into that icy nullity. Convulsion, she heard someone mutter. She felt her hands upon her, firm hands, swimming over her body, spreading in oily warmth. Mercilessly, light and heat invaded her, piercing her to the marrow, dragging her up into the agony of consciousness. She opened her eyes. A face floated above her. White hair, white beard, burning black eyes. A serpent's head dipped it. Next, dipped in next to the man's head and poised there, looking down at her. She tried to greet him, but couldn't make her voice work. The man's wrinkles kindled. He smiled, snag-toothed. She saw him lift a vial and pour a little oil into the cup of his hand. His hand came down on her again. They were very gentle hands hard behind the softness, moving with great authority upon her belly, her legs, her shoulders, her chest. She felt the soles of her feet being massaged, and each arm slowly along its whole length, wrist and knuckle and palm. Fingers forked her nose, moving down her cheekbones over lips and chin, and where the hands moved they dragged sleep behind them. Now she slid into a different darkness. And when she awoke again, the light had changed. It had been torchlight before, flickering and ruddy. Now there was a pale seepage from one side, and against it the man's head, black as a cutout. She was in a cave, she saw. She lay on a pile of rushes. He was sitting at the mouth of the cave, chin on chest, asleep. And the serpent was gone. She lay there, breathing easily, smelling the damp mustiness of the cave, the sweet odor of freshly cut rushes. There was a heaviness on her arm. She turned her head to look at it. The arm was bandaged. She lifted it, flexed it. There was a soreness. She sat up, trying to make no noise. 
She stared at the sleeping man, impatient of the faulty light, because of all she could see was his hair and beard. Something flickered behind his head. The flicker became a warmth. A swarm, a foul stench filled the air. They were bats. They had leathery wings. Not bats. They had brass claws and tiny hag faces. She screamed. They screamed. The man was on his feet. He scooped up two rocks and clapped them together, catching one of the things between. It fell to the ground but was not crushed. It scuttled out, trailing one wing. They circled his head, diving at him, trying to gouge his face with their brass claws. He clapped his rocks furiously. They screamed in chorus and flew away. He hurled the rocks after them. He turned to her. Come, come. Ugh, it stinks in here. He left the cave and she followed him. She could not believe that so deep a voice had come out of this small, emaciated, limping man. He sat cross-legged, twirling a fire stick into a log. A spark winked. He blew on it gently, fed it twigs. It fattened into flame. He dipped into his pouch and pinched out some dust, which he dropped under the fire. A fragrance arose. He waved his hand, sending the smoke into the mouth of the cave. That will drive out the stench. What? What were they? What were those things? Empusai. Well, what's that? They are the small demons who attend Hecate, queen of the harpies, as she goes around and Tartarus tormenting the shades. These scurvy creatures have one donkey's hoof each and one brass hoof. Their hands are claws, they have leather wings, and sometimes they're sent up here on special errands. Well, what kind of errands? The kind you saw. They are sent to torment me in the first place, also to report what I'm doing. Why? Why would anyone want to torment you? They serve Hecate. Hecate serves Hades, king of the dead, and Hades hates me. The serpent thrust swiftly between them. He cast a single loop about Palamona's shoulders, his, put his head hard against her cheek, then whisked away and coiled between them, rising out of his coils until his head was level with the man's. Did they come again? The snake asked. Yes, they did. So much for black cloaks and night marches. It's no good. They find you wherever you go. You simply must not go anywhere. Do I have a choice? said the man. Choice? You? Are you not the great spokesman for choice, even among the helpless? Are you not he who preaches that illness itself is a matter of choice. Yes, sometimes I regret having taught you logic, said the man. I wish you could teach the essence of serpent lore. I wish I could teach it to you, which is self-preservation. Why does Hades hate you? said Palamona. <laughs> My eloquent friend will tell you, said the man. Stand up, please. The man knelt down as she stood up and put his ear to her chest listened, then moved it to another place. She stared at the white head under her eyes. She could see the pink skull underneath and smell its piney smell. She clung to the snake's hissing voice. The man is Melampus, the healer. So miraculous are his skills that he pulls people back from the brink of death. In fact, he has been known to retrieve those who have gone over the brink. Thus he robs Hades of subjects and is loathed by that red lord. And Pusai were sent against him today. The next time it may be the Furies, and they are a different matter. A thousand times worse. They'll scourge the flesh from his bones. His only hope is to let the dying die and not meddle with the dead at all. True, true, muttered the man. He ruffled Palamona's hair and arose. They're all right, my girl. You'll be able to take that bandage off in a day or so. Let us go, master, said the serpent. The sooner we're back in Thessaly, the better. You'll have to stay there no matter how many fishermen get their stupid heads bashed in. The serpent turned to her Palamona. He promised me he'd keep out of sight until Hades cooled off. But this message came that the river clans there had begun to fight over fishing grounds, and battered bodies were strewn about the banks. So he forgot all about his promises. I took precautions, said the lapis. I came in deepest secrecy. No welcome, no torches, no display. I slipped in, I worked fast, and slipped out. Deepest secrecy. <laughs> 
said the serpent. That's why the Impusa knew exactly where to find you. They wouldn't have known if we hadn't stopped to do what had to be done. Yes, said the serpent. We would have been in Thessaly by now, except he heard some bees bragging about people stung to death and the honor of the hive upheld. So the good doctor let his skiff come inland and restored the others and worked on you all night. Delighted to see that you're yourself again, little one. But now I must get him into hiding before Hades learns that he has been deprived of three perfectly good corpses in one night. Melampus had put his back, put on his black cloak. I'm ready, he said. Take me with you, said the girl. What? I want to go with you. No, 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 no. Please, sir, I'm so lonesome. The people I lived with, the woodsman's family, were all killed or kidnapped, all except me. I have no friends here except a few animals, and this young man, man who doesn't even know he's my friend, and he's dead, only he's not dead because you brought him back, but still, please, take me. Impossible. Please, I need to go with you. You don't know what you're asking. I live alone except for this fellow now and then and some other attendant beasts. Because of Hades' anger, I don't even treat humans anymore, if I can avoid it, just animals. I live the simplest, roughest kind of life. Oh, sounds wonderful. Please take me. She moved close, but did not dare touch him. She turned her face up so he could see all she meant. As I see it, doctor, said the serpent, she might be useful. I licked her ear, you know. She understands the language of beast and bird. You could use an unsalaried assistant in that unpaid practice of yours. Oh, why did you come to her with a gift of tongues? I was sent. I see. He had not looked down into her face. Now he did. The black fire of his eyes stabbed down into hers. Oh, oh. By all the fiends of hell, have I not enough troubles that I have to take on this weird little runaway? She shivered in the rough music of his voice. Oh, thank you, she whispered. Again that night, the black skiff slid down to the river, towed by the serpent. There was no moon, and Melampus sat in the stern with his head unhooded. Palamona crouched in the bow, listening to the frogs and birds who fell silent as the snake passed. The smooth rush through the darkness, the faint chorus of strange, intelligible voices resembled the voyages of sleep, and she was terrified lest she awake in the woodsman's hut. Having dreamed the bloody head and swift rekas and the giant bee, having dreamed the hands of Melampus, must she awake to find herself as she had been before dread and joy, but she was awake. It was all happening. She was on her way to Thessaly with him, and the joy swelled until she could not sit still. She wanted to laugh, shout, sing. She wanted to jump in the river and swim, but she had been told that she must not even whisper until they came out of the river into the sea. Her thoughts began to float. She bit her hand to keep herself awake. She resolved not to sleep until they'd reached Thessaly. Until then, there was still some chance she might awaken into the old mode, dwarfed, frozen, calling after playmates who ran away. The trees paled, birds clamored, Palamona slept. They passed through the mouth of the river and into the sea. The serpent pulled the boat around a headland and held it still as Melampus released, raised sail and fixed a rudder oar. The serpent swam to the stern and raised his head. I must go now. Thank you, friend, said Melampus. I'll come to you as soon as I can. I know. Please go into hiding. I mean to keep out of sight. Farewell, said the snake and slid away. Palamona awoke to a tilting sail and new movement. A surge in a lilt. She rubbed her eyes. They had come out of the darkness into a great wash of light. Melampa sat in the stern, steering with a big hinged oar. The wind tugged at his hair and beard. Good morning, he said. Good morning, she said. It's 8 p.m. No, no, you dreamed it, little one. It's morning time. Oh, so we don't have to end our story just yet? Not yet, little one. There'll be a couple more minutes. I see. And so I repeat myself. Good morning. Where did the serpent go? To his master. Doesn't he belong to you? No one owns him, not even Apollo, whom he serves. He is an oracular serpent, one of the seven sacred pythons of Delphi. But he is the wiliest of all, and other gar gods borrow him for special tasks. Befriending me was his own idea. He comes to me whenever he can, but it cannot be often, for I am no favorite of the gods. I thought only Hades hated you. Oh, he's the worst. 
Has he always pursued you? Well, ever since I took up the family trade, he's pursued me, which I started training for when I was a lad. Actually, the feud goes back much farther. It began with my ancestor, Asclepius, who was a healer such as the world has never seen. He answered every call, took no fee, and then descended upon battlefields more swiftly than the vultures to work among the wounded. He saved so many people that he kindled the wrath of Hades, that black, curling rage that will pursue Asclepides to the, under the last generation. He fell silent and gazed across the water. Tell, 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 cried Palamona. Ah, well, said the man, Hades came like a whirlwind out of Tartarus, roaring up the slope of Olympus. He appeared before Zeus and lodged his complaint. The king of the gods listened attentively to his eldest brother, who accused Asclepius of trespass, robbery, and sacrilege, of offending the dignity of all the gods by challenging the authority of any god. Zeus nodded. He hurled a thunderbolt. Asclepius was in a hut in Thessaly, tending shepherd lad who had been crushed by a falling rock. Thunder spoke from a clear sky. A tongue of flame hooked down, touching the straw roof of the hut. It flared like a torch. Asclepius was burned to death. The shepherd also, his parents, and his dog. I hate Zeus, cried the girl. Hush, hush, never say that. I don't care, I do. I hate Hades, and I hate Zeus. He clapped his hand over her mouth. Hush, I said. She began to weep. He drew her down to his lap and held her. A dolphin leaped clear over the boat. The sea was a million points of light, and he stroked her hair. She tried to stop crying, but could not. She thought of Asclepius whom she pictured as looking exactly like Melampus, saw the flames, heard the screams of the shepherd lad, tears poured down her face and into her mouth. He pushed her off his lap and stood up, holding her by the arms. You know, he said, I think you've grown taller. She stopped crying. Look, we only met three days ago. You just came up to here, I may remember. Now you come up to here. You've grown that much in three days. I don't believe it, she whispered. You're just trying to... I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. It's because you did the other kind of crying. What do you mean? There are two kinds of crying. Mostly we weep because we're sorry for ourselves. And these tears of self-pity diminish us. But there's another kind of grief, one that pierces an unsullied heart when others suffer. Such tears enlarge us. You weep for Asclepius, dead. And you grow, my child. She stared at him silently. You know what? What? I shall tell you many sad stories, and we shall catch your tears in a jug and pour them into a barrel. When you have a barrel full, you may drink it, and... She whipped away from him, huddling in the boat's stern, looking back at the wake. A barrel isn't enough. I'm so hatefully small, I'd have to drink a lake full. Careful, he said. You're beginning to grieve for yourself. You'll shrink again. I don't care. Yes, you do. And so do I. Her yellow eyes flared, and he smiled. Now, Palamona, if you're very good and believe all my sad stories and weep barrelfuls, you shall drink of them, and instead of being the smallest girl of the world, you'll be the tallest. He saw that her face was wet. He drew her to him and kissed her eyes. Too salty to drink, he said. She shuddered. His lips were gentle and cold, like those of a nurse kissing a child. Boom, boom, boom. End of part one. Part two, the conclusion, this time next week.